in a normal fold, there must be flow in order to compensate for that difference in, um, in behavior between the two layers. If the anticline were not the shape that it were, if it were like this, we would have an asymmetrical anticline. That is, the two sides are not mirror images of one, one another. This limb is much steeper than this limb. If we continue to press, we could even produce an anticline with an overturned limb. We would call this a recumbent anticline. And of course, the corresponding form, a trough rather than an anticline, we would call a syncline, and it can have all those kinds of shapes as well. Here is an asymmetrical syncline with one limb overturned. That would be a symmetrical syncline. The axial plane is in here. There are the two limbs of the syncline. Now, of course, rocks don't always behave plastically once they've reached their elastic limit. As you saw in the squeeze box, fractures began to develop here and then also up here and two in the sand, which also behaves plastically like the plaster there. Rocks can only absorb so much deformation, so much stress, before they fracture. Now, the pattern which the rocks form when they fracture is what we use in order to describe the different kinds of faults. When rocks are dragged apart by tension, then the pattern is, which is produced is where the layers are separated from one another, and one side slips down, and the other side looks as though it's moved up. We can never tell which. And there is the fault plane. We call this a normal fault, these layers having moved this way and these this way. That's the situation also in the faults in the Precambrian of the Grand Canyon that we've already looked at. Here, the fault plane is inclined in a different direction, but the layers have been pulled apart. Each of these is a normal fault. In cases where the rocks have been driven over one another, in other words, there has been squeezing, the stress has been a squeezing stress, then we call this a reverse fault. And in this case, the black layer has been driven above the, its mate on the other side of the, the fault. There again is the fault plane, as we call it. And if you were to put a borehole down here, you'd find you crossed the red layer and the black layer twice. A special case a variety, if you like, of reverse fault is where the fault plane is very flat, almost horizontal, and the top layers look as though they've been thrust over the lower layers. And we call this a thrust fault. And very often, you have to collect fossils from these different rock layers in order to tell that the red, for example, the red layer here, is in fact older than the yellow layer on which it seems to lie especially if the fault plane in the field is covered by vegetation, a very confusing kind of fault. Now, faults can also act in pairs, and usually do, in fact, occur at least in pairs. And we can illustrate the kind of form that they produce with this model. If we move these layers apart, or alternatively push the middle one up, then we produce what is called a graben, or sorry, I'm sorry, a horst, the upthrust or the upmoved block being a horst. Two normal faults, one there and one there. The opposite case, where a graben is produced, is when the faults are inclined in the opposite direction, inclined towards another, one another. Once again, normal faults, the movement being like that. This is produced, in fact, by tension, the pulling apart of the, the two sides, allowing the central block to slip into the middle. This is the kind of fault which is produced when pieces of lithosphere 
are split like down rift valleys. Uh, the tension allows the center to drop, and eventually this is the point where oceans originate. Compression has produced a syncline and anticline, and a reverse fault is visible on the right-hand side of the photograph. Compression also produced this anticline in the Rocky Mountains, a very sharp anticline in this case. And the axial plane of the anticline, the line dividing the two limbs one from the other, is slightly inclined from left to right. This fold is in metamorphic rock, and the plasticity during the metamorphism is very well illustrated. Folds are often associated with faults, and these folds in California are associated with the San Andreas Fault. In this case, the plasticity of the rock is due to the fact that it's still soft and sandy and muddy, not by any means consolidated into the very, very hard state that rocks do when they're deeply buried. In this case, the deformation has been concentrated along certain lines. And here also in this larger scale example, and the rock in fact has fractured at the hinge of the fold, and the limbs of the fold are quite flat. In fact, you would hardly suspect that a, that a fold was, was present just by looking at the outcrop on the shore. In this case, the deformation of the thin sedimentary beds is rather like the crumpling of a pack of cards. The deformation has been concentrated again along certain lines, and these rather brittle folds we call kink bands or kink folds. The deformation here has also been rather like the crumpling of a pack of cards, and there are some overturned folds in this cliff section. This very obvious fault in the Northwest Territories is one of a pair of normal faults which form the margins of a graben. The watery area has been dropped down between the, the two faults. On the rim of the Grand Canyon are fault cuts of volcano. And the San Andreas Fault, two blocks have moved past one another, and a stream was displaced at the point of the arrow. Here, the summit of the cliffs, the massive limestone, has been thrust over the younger rock in the valley, and this is a thrust fault, rather difficult to see, but in fact lying at the base of the massive uh, limestone forming the summit of the cliffs. The limestone is Cambrian, and the rocks in the valley are Cretaceous in age. A sketch of the Yamnuska hillside shows the position of the fault much more clearly. Here it lies at the foot of the steep cliffs the overthrust Cambrian strata lying on the Cretaceous strata at the foot of the valley. Now, faults such as that are difficult enough to spot, even exposed on a broad hillside like that. But other structures are even more difficult. In uh, the case of folds, for example, geologists would rarely see a, a complete fold exposed in an area such as northern Ontario. And the kind of observations that have to be made depend upon measuring the orientation of sedimentary strata, which are assumed to have been originally horizontal. Let's imagine this as an originally horizontal sandstone or limestone or shale layer or whatever, tilted in this fashion, perhaps being one limb of an anticline. In order to record that orientation, a geologist would measure the dip of the layer after its deformation, and he would also measure the strike. The strike is at right angles to the dip, 